Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. I'm going to be your host today, and today is a super special breaking news episode of Adler Astronomy Live, all about the recent discovery and detection of phosphine around Venus, which could potentially be a sign of living organisms around Venus. Huge news this week. We are so excited to be doing this episode. Um, so for those of you who have never joined us before, the Adler Planetarium is currently closed to the public. So we are trying to bring some of our awesome programming online to you in the digital world. And one of the things we pride ourselves on is the ability for our guests to come into our building and actually talk to real live experts about their expertise in their fields of science. So that's what we're going to be doing today and we have some awesome special guests with us today. Um, we are all joining you from within our homes. Because of that you might get some bonus features such as a technical difficulty or uh, potentially somebody's cat or um, a child joining them on video. For that, we just ask for your patience and understanding and we hope that you are ready to have some fun. Okay, with us, we have two special guests. First, we have Dr. Clara Souza Silva. Hi, Clara. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you. And you're joining us from rural Maine, right? Yes, uh, so apologies in advance for any technical problems that come this way. It is pretty, but it has its downsides. <laughs> You're living the dream, the quarantine dream. Um, also, uh, Clara was able to get her internet up and working literally four minutes before we started this program. It was so exciting. Um, so we got her here, but if something goes wrong, you can always just call in. Uh, we're excited. Okay, also with us, we have Dr. Emily drawback Monder. Hi, Emily. Hi, thank you for having me. Where are you joining us from? So I'm coming to you from Greenwich in London, England. So cool. I was telling Emily before we started that I went there once and it was the coolest thing ever. What a cool place. Uh, the Royal Observatory. Okay, so Clara and Emily are both authors on the Venus Phosphine Discovery article. That's a big deal. I'd like to dive a little deeper into what that means potentially later. Um, but basically, it's a huge achievement to write a paper. And we talked about it a little bit on our first uh, episode of Adler Astronomy Live. Basically, a discovery means nothing until the paper is written. And um, I'm sure that you've been keeping it super secret as well and like having to work on this, keep it inside, because what a huge, massive discovery. Um, also, OK, so we have Clara who is a molecular astrophysicist at MIT, and I was like, astrophysicist, not physicist. Okay, and Emily is an astro astrophysicist and senior manager of public astronomy at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Um, and then also we have Mark Subrow who is running this whole thing and will be showing us some cool visuals. All right, so this program is meant to be totally interactive, which means we want to hear from you, our YouTube audience. Please utilize the chat function in YouTube to ask questions for our guests. We have Laura, who's gonna be joining you there in the chats. Laura will get your questions over to us. Uh, Laura is one of our astronomers at the Adler, and we also have Geza, another astronomer from the Adler who will be joining you and potentially answering some questions that we might not get to. So, cool. Let's get started. I'm so excited. Um, why don't we just start with the basics? Emily, can let's, let's just talk about the background around the exciting, exciting space news. What does it mean? What is this discovery? Why is it so exciting? Okay, so in our study, we've used telescopes to spot a rare gas in the clouds of Venus. Um, and this gas is called phosphine. Now on Earth, phosphine gas is mainly connected to life. So it's produced by human activity through things like industry, um, or it's produced by microorganisms or what we call microbes. Now, our discovery is incredibly exciting um, because so far our team can't explain the amount of phosphine gas that we find in Venus's clouds, at least with our current understanding of the planet. So what that means is that we have to start thinking outside the box. The phosphine gas that we see could be produced through some sort of unknown chemical or geological process happening on the planet, but it, like the Earth, it could also be produced by some sort of life in uh, the clouds of Venus. So something like microbes in those clouds. So exciting. So it's just opened up the possibilities, uh, especially at such a near neighbor. I don't, I don't know, have we been looking at Venus for potential life before, or is this kind of a new idea? So really, you know, we didn't know much about Venus until the 1960s. And before that, we thought of Venus uh, like Earth's twin or sister planet. Um, but then in the 1960s, we started sending spacecraft uh, to study our solar system. And actually the first interplanetary spacecraft 
uh, Mariner 2 went out to the planet Venus. And it was at that point that we kind of realized how hellish the planet Venus is. <laughs> um, and it really is, you know, it's a very hostile, harsh place. Um, so, you know, even at that time, it was theorized, um, you know, Carl Sagan uh, famously uh, wrote a paper on this, um, that instead of on the surface of the planet, um, maybe there was life kind of um, in the clouds of Venus where it's a little bit nicer. I love imagining that uh, these living organisms potentially hanging out in these clouds floating around together. Um, okay, Clara, you are the expert on this molecule, phosphine, and also your Twitter, Twitter handle is Dr. Phosphine, correct? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> that is so fun. Earlier, Mark was like, that sounds like a Bond villain. Uh, it's really oh God, it does this, isn't it? Yes. Phosphine is a very dangerous molecule, so I did hesitate uh, associating my social media presence with it, but when I was doing, I did my PhD on phosphine, and I would go to conferences, and once in a while people will be like oh are you miss phosphine and i'll be like well yes but one day i'll be dr phosphine and so <laughs> here we are i will say this though you don't look like a villain can i say that well you can't judge a book by its cover mm -hmm. uh okay so can you just tell us what makes this molecule so special um it's special to me because i've dedicated my career to it um and i've spent a long time telling bored or audiences they should care about phosphine and so i'm very excited about this discovery if nothing else because the whole world now cares about phosphine <laughs> yes. but, but yeah in in principle phosphine is not a complicated molecule so it looks like this i always have a model on my desk <laughs> um so one phosphorus and three hydrogens and it's shaped like a pyramid um but when Light hits it, it bends, and it twists, and it absorbs energy in very spe special ways, very unique ways. I spent my PhD uh, simulating all of the unique ways in which it uh, can bend and twist, and I calculated 16.8 billion ways it can do this. And we detected one of those on Venus. Uh, and so it's really quite incredible. What? <laughs> How do you even count something like that? I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of supercomputers and, and uh, admittedly some sweat and tears. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we do have some questions coming in from our audience. First is from Sonia, who wants to know, how are you able to identify the gas just by sight without testing? I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer that one. Yeah, go. So um, the way we find phosphine is by using a method called spectroscopy. Um, so if you think about it this way, the reason why we can see Venus, even in the night sky, without a telescope, just using our eyes, is because sunlight is reflecting off the planet back to the Earth. It's kind of lighting up the, the clouds that surround Venus. Well, phosphine will actually absorb a little bit of that light um, uh, that's on its way to the Earth. And it absorbs a very specific color of light because actually all light that we see, white light is made up of many different colors or wavelengths. And that phosphine gas will absorb a little bit uh, of that light at a very specific color or wavelength of light. And so if we tune our telescopes and instruments on the telescopes to that wavelength or color, then we can search for phosphine. So cool. And it looks like Jeff G. William uh, asked if there was a specific wavelength, ra wavelength range that might confirm the existence of phosphine. So I, I think you kind of answered the question. Are there any, any instruments available to look at Venus in that range? Yeah, so we found uh, phosphine by its very distinctive properties in the microwave. So really low energy transitions. And that's where phosphine is really neat and organized. And so we were able to isolate that one feature of phosphine and know that phosphine is very much the best candidate for the signal we saw. In the infrared, then uh, phosphine is also very active and has a beautiful spectrum, but it's a little messier. And so it's harder to, even if we detect features, to unambiguously uh, assign them to phosphine rather than a different molecule. But we are trying really hard using any instruments we can and just to find another confirmation that phosphine is there. In the ultraviolet and the optical, phosphine can't handle it. Those are high energies and for phosphine to absorb there in any significant way, it has to survive not getting destroyed when it gets hit by high energy. And 
It can't. Phosphine is a quiet molecule in many ways and can't really do UV and optical, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So cool. I'm totally responsible. <laughs> you're not. What you're doing is amazing. You're Dr. Phosphine. Um, okay, we have a question from somebody named Doggo Wolf, which in my mind, I can't help but imagine that this is just literally a dog sitting on his computer, uh, <laughs> who wants to know, okay, so let's just make this clear. The phosphine molecules are not alive, correct? That is not life. That's, and can you explain a little bit about like that connection between why we're thinking life and phosphine? Sure, yeah. Um, so the phosphine molecules themselves are not alive, mm -hmm. um, but phosphine can be produced by some life that we see here on the earth. Um, so for example, like I mentioned before, microorganisms or microbes. And actually um, there's a weird connection between penguins and these microorganisms. So um, the microorganisms in penguin guts can actually produce phosphine. Um, and so when you kind of look at waste products from penguins, um, it has lots of phosphine uh, that can be found. Um, so, so yeah, it's a product of life, but the phosphine molecules themselves aren't living. I loved watching that interview. Can you tell the story just about studying penguin poop in Venus? Um, so yeah, th this is one of the, well, when I first got involved with the study four years ago, when we were first putting the proposals together, to um, search for phosphine in the clouds of Venus. Um, I was working with uh, the lead scientist of the study, Jane Greaves, um, who's from Cardiff University. And she proposed uh, the project to me to try to get me on board by one day walking into my office and saying, would you like to study penguin poop in Venus's clouds? <laughs> and I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, what is <laughs> going on here? And she was referring to this um, study a few years ago that showed the correlation between penguins and phosphine. And so specifically that, so penguin waste, it has all of this phosphine in, and you find the phosphine in the soil in Antarctic regions. And um, so that's kind of what kickstarted, um, you know, the idea that maybe we can search for this really special gas in Venus's clouds to better assess um, if there is life in, in the clouds. Yeah, it all, it all started from penguins and penguin guano. I love it. Those, those penguins as well, as we're pointing out, there's phosphine above the poop. So the, the poop communicates to the atmosphere that it's there. And, and so it's, it's like a, a message of the life in that poop. And it's not just penguins. Uh, human babies also have phosphine in their intestines and, and badgers as well. In fact, we think most animals uh, have life, rich, complex life uh, inside their guts, producing phosphine rather happily and releasing into the atmosphere, hoping someone will detect it. Um, and we're trying to do the same on Venus. Amazing. Penguins are actually my favorite animal and the fact that their poop is communicating makes them extra special to me now. Uh, okay, so we have a question. Da, 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 da. What are some non-living processes on Earth that could produce phosphine? So on, on Earth, phosphine seems to be exclusively produced by life, either naturally by these um, anaerobic environments. So, you know, things in poop and farts and intestines and, and things like that, but also swamps and sewage plants and lake sediments and marshlands. So places that don't have a lot of oxygen. But it also gets produced in quite large quantities through human ingenuity. So in the lab, through quite a lot of effort, usually for as a fumigant or pesticide, so for agri agricultural um, processes, but also it was used as a chemical warfare agent in the First World War and most recently by ISIS. So it's also used for really horrible reasons. And it is uh, produced as an unfortunate byproduct of methamphetamine labs. So a few, a few interesting techno signatures as well as a sign of anaerobic life. Okay, so if, if whatever is on Venus or surrounding Venus uh, producing this phosphine is not from a living being, it's something that we just don't know anything about. It would be a completely new discovery, a new way of producing phosphine, correct? Yeah, phosphine is just really hard to make. You know, the phosphorus doesn't want to be with the hydrogen. It has better things to do, like be with oxygen. 
And these hydrogens have better things to do like make methane or water. And so it's actually accidentally to make this happen, you, you need to put quite a lot of effort into it. And humans put effort into things, life puts effort into things. Um, but otherwise to make phosphine, you need to throw a lot of energy at it. Um, so it's formed in Jupiter and Saturn, but it's because in there it's pretty intense. Um, normal rocky planets like Earth and like Venus don't have an easy way of making it. Okay, we had some questions about that, about Jupiter and Saturn, um, and if there is the potential for life on Jupiter and Saturn, if you've uh, considered that because of the phosphine, but it sounds like because of just, go, go ahead, you explain it better. There's than a me. lot of uncertainty in this discovery, but I can confidently say there there is no life on Jupiter and Saturn. Cool. Um, Emily, please <laughs> intervene. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I completely agree with you. So, I mean, like you'd said before, you know, down in the depths of uh, gas giant planets, you have very high temperatures and very high pressures. And so, and that's when you see phosphine made. And then just through convection, it will rise up into the atmosphere. And then that's when you can detect it with telescopes. So, no, I mean, those processes wouldn't be produced from life. It, it's just from chemistry. Yeah. Cool. And then... <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, in case people are wondering, because the surface of Venus also has very high pressure, it's not just any pressure that makes phosphine. It has to be a special kind of pressure, which is lots of hydrogen atoms. So hydrogen atoms hitting the phosphorus atom. And in Jupiter and Saturn, there's a lot of hydrogen, but uh, the surface of Venus, where there is a lot of pressure, it's not hydrogen pressure. And so that's the big difference and can't make phosphine, at least in a way we understand. Wow. Okay. So we do have a question from Gallifreyan Girl 40. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, who wants to know uh, just basically about what, what you would need to look at more distant planets. I'm assuming really distant, maybe exoplanets. Um, I'm just making that assumption because we're talking about Jupiter and Saturn. You can detect it there. But like, what about exoplanets? Are you able to use tools that we currently have right now to detect phosphine on exoplanets? So I published on this in January and this is work that I also, um, uh, that I, Jane and Emily are aware of. I, before Jane got to me and told me of the wonderful news that maybe we found phosphine on Venus, I'd spent many years trying to figure out how to find phosphine on faraway worlds. Uh, that could be habitable and I worked really hard to see how many photons I could collect from these really far away planets to figure out if we could find phosphine so we could find life and the whole time it was right here next door and <laughs> and I never ever thought to check so I'm so thankful to Jane um, but the conclusions of that paper were basically any detectable amounts of phosphine on any terrestrial planets can only mean life and it wasn't really an outrageous conclusion until, of course, we found it next door. But we did we did find that with JWST, the James uh, Clark uh, James James Webb Space Telescope, mm -hmm. uh, different telescope, um, we would be able to detect uh, phosphine on kind of small super Earths. Um, and so that was my focus for a long time. So possible within about sixteen parsec, but. Um, you need to have a planet orbiting a much smaller star than our own. So brown dwarfs, smaller stars. Okay, cool. The James Webb Telescope is just so, we're all waiting for it. We're so excited. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your story. I, I know I alluded to how significant writing papers are in the field of science, but also like when did this you started talking about this five years ago, the penguin poop discussion. Um, so it, was that the beginning of this? And, and then how, like, what is that like to get to where we are today and actually announcing it to the public? Can you tell us a little bit about that process and, and you know, how does that feel? <laughs> uh, I just wanna hear. So I can talk a little bit about the observational side of things. So yeah, that, that started about four years ago. And um, to be completely honest, when we, first put the proposal together, we knew it was a high risk, high reward sort of study. Um, and we didn't actually think we were going to find phosphine on Venus. I think when we first put the proposal together, we thought, okay, we're going to search for phosphine for, uh, on Venus, and but we might not find anything. But still not 
finding the gas would really help us find something out about the planet. And it would help us kind of rule out certain possible scenarios for life in the clouds of Venus, um, even without detecting anything. Um, so I think it was a bit of a shock when we did find something. I think yeah. um, it was something that was really unexpected. But because we didn't originally expect to find anything, we actually found it very difficult to convince telescopes to give us time to do these observations. So um, the first telescope we, we did the observations with, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope um, in Hawaii, um, we were rejected at least once from that telescope. So our proposal just didn't, um, I, you know, it, it just didn't get the time. And you can see the, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope here, actually the, the one that made the discovery in, in Hawaii, the initial discovery. Cool. Um, eventually we applied directly through the, the director of the telescope and just asked, can we please do this really fun uh, proposal? Um, you know, it, it could, you know, if we did find something like phosphine gas on Venus, it could be really important, you know, this discovery. And they, they gave us the time um, and which was great. You know, they are the ones who really gave us the chance to do this study. And, and without the James Clerk Maxwell telescope, um, this study wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have happened really. Um, so, so we finally got those observations. Um, and then once we had those observations, we were able to then ask for a follow-up um, detection of phosphine using a, a more powerful telescope, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA for short. And that's in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which you can see here on the screen now. So it's actually a collection of many telescopes that all act together. It's what we call an interferometer. And without that initial observation from the James Clerk Maxwell telescope, we would have never gotten time on ALMA to, to confirm phosphine gas in Venus's clouds. Um, because before, before we had that detection, we were also rejected from ALMA a couple of times as well. So this is one of the reasons why the study took so long and why it took so many years is because, you know, it, it took so long to convince people to give us the chance to really go after these observations. Um, so, so yeah, so it's just kind of, you know, going through the, the observations and yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm curious, in the world of space science, obviously, you know, everybody is curious about life and the potential for life elsewhere. Is it a little bit of a stigma to have that actually be like your, your field of study? Like, is it a little bit, do people think like, oh, that's woo-woo stuff, I, you know what I mean? Uh, do you think that's one of the reasons why you kept getting turned down? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, I, I think, um, it, you know, it can be controversial when you say like, well, I, I want to search for life um, in, you know, a planet that's close to us in our solar system. Um, but in general, I mean, astrobiology is, you know, I, a real field in, in astronomy that you can pursue. And I think, you know, it's, it's just important always, you know, all the time in science, not just when you apply for time on a telescope, but just in general, you have to put what you're doing into context and you have to consider everything before you start, you know, considering things outside the box and start considering things that, you know, would just be an alternative explanation to what we currently know about a planet or about space. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Okay. So that brings me back to, um, you know, okay. So you just, you, you have to go through all these hoops and like all these specifics to decide to start looking. And then now you've started looking, you find something and now you have to work together to prove it to the world through a paper. Um, involving so many different people, expertise. Uh, Lucianne, one of our astronomers, said it was akin to um, wrangling cats <laughs> uh, or herding cats. Uh, it, it's it's a huge undertaking. It's not just like you know back in college, like I have a paper due tomorrow. I got to stay up all night typing it. <laughs> it's a huge thing. So can you tell me a little bit about that, and then also just knowing that you have something big to tell the world, and how are you going to tell it? All that. Well, I mean, I think once we had the observations, you know, that's when we had to explain what the phosphine gas meant in the clouds of Venus and where it was coming from. And that's really where Clara comes in, I think, 
um, because she's able to do that through through models. Yeah, astrobiology sometimes is not really respected by some scientists, but um, but it does require a big interdisciplinary team. You know, you need a lot of people to handle the observations and all the incredible expertise that that requires. But then you need people who can model the atmosphere of Venus and model spectra from Venus. And so we had Hideo Sagawa doing models of Venus to try and understand how the signal that we got, what it, what does it mean in terms of how much phosphine there is? And then I had to come in as a quantum chemist to figure out by the shape of the line, how much phosphine there could be in there. And then we had William Baines and Janusz Petkowski trying to figure out what if enough meteors hit Venus, could they make enough phosphine to uh, replicate what we saw? What if it was comets? What if it was cosmic rays? What if it was volcanoes? What if it was bismuth snow reacting with something on the surface? What if it was tectonic plates moving around? And so they had to try and come up with literally any explanation that could justify the phosphine we found. And you know that's proving a negative. And so it's very hard to feel like you've exhausted all the options. And that was really hard work. Yeah. And then when was the paper kind of done versus when did it actually come out? Oh. Do you want to explain how the review process works, please? <laughs> <laughs> so um, when was the paper done? Um, back in January, wow. I think. Um, so yeah, I mean, the review process, you know, you submit your paper and then you have reviewers look at your paper. So experts in the field will read the paper. They'll, you know, th their goal is to tear it to shreds. You know, they're <laughs> questioning you. They're, at, you know, they're making sure that you've done everything that you can and try to answer every question that you can with what you have, with the data you have. Um, so, so yeah, and that can be a very brutal process. It takes a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that can take months, if not years to, to also do. Um, so, so I can't remember when the, the paper was officially submitted to Nature Astronomy, um, but we did get um, the confirmation that it was going to be published, I believe in, in the summer, so around July time. And then the paper was under embargo, meaning we could not talk about it with anyone um, until Monday, so uh, until September 14th. Um, wow. So, so yeah, it, but it, you know, it took months and months and months to, to really go through this entire process. That must feel, will... no, go ahead. I was going to say, even with the reviewers, it's a bit of a conversation. You know, they read your initial submission. They say, you haven't considered this. I think in our case, one of the reviewers was like, well, I read the Wikipedia page and I think I can make phosphine. So oh. we had to like, Fair point. We we also read the Wikipedia page. Um, he read in detail how you cannot make phosphine with a Wikipedia page entry, and so and then they come back and they go, okay, much better with a Wikipedia page thing. But what about this other way of making phosphine? And so it's a back and forth. And only when they say, okay, we're satisfied, um, we cannot think of any other way of making phosphine, and we are satisfied with everything else you did, that we can say, okay, it's accepted. And then we wait in painful silence. Oh my goodness. Congratulations on making it through that process. And also that now it's live, you can tell anybody. I mean, I was going to ask, does it feel kind of, I bet it feels isolating to just have this information and be work, dedicating your life to this, but not be able to talk about it, first of all. But then it's also, it probably, did you feel like you bonded so much more with your team to be sharing in this amazing discovery and secret and like only have each other to share it with for a while? Yeah, I, I think that was definitely true. I mean, um, whenever I would see Jane, for example, or other team members, we would just kind of give one another the look like, do you want to talk about the paper? Okay, let's go talk about the paper, you know, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it, it was, you know, I think that that can lead to, to a lot of bonding and things. And, um, you know, also, everyone's just going through the initial rejection together, you know, you can have a bit, you know, you could be a bit grumpy about referees or about um, reports from telescopes together. And that's all very bonding as well. You know, other people are in it with you um, and kind of understand what you're going through as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think all of that can can be quite a nice bonding experience. Incredible. And the whole time I was trying to get, you know, other telescopes to give us time so we could 
confirm phosphine in the infrared or, or, you know, really just any other feature. So that when the paper came out, you know, on Monday, people won't say, but you, you haven't looked anywhere else. And we could say we did, we tried really hard and we did try really hard, but all our observations were canceled because of COVID. So we can oh. Yeah, the timeline is really lining up with, you know, having this ready in January and wow. I am sorry that you had to go through that, but you you have worked so hard. Kind of came out of this pandemic. It's really okay. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like I, I was saying earlier, this is just such great news that we needed. You know, something so fun. Um, okay, so we do have some questions that are coming in, but before we go, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, if anybody is joining us right now for the first time, we are talking about the incredible new discovery of phosphine around Venus and what that means. Could it potentially be a sign of life? Um, we have some awesome guests with us, Dr. Emily Maunder and Dr. Clara Sousa Silva, uh, who are joining us to talk about what it meant to write this paper um, and to publish this information and also what it means. And here to answer your questions. So please shoot your questions over to Laura in the chats in YouTube. She will get your questions over to us and we will answer them as best we can. And also Laura is going to share a link for donating to the Adler. As you may or may not know, we are currently closed to the public because of COVID. Um, and so any donation is welcome, whether it's, you know, uh, $7 for the number of months that we've been waiting to uh, share this discovery. I guess it was more like nine, right? Nine months. Wow. $9 for the number of months we've been waiting to share this discovery. Uh, and by we, I don't mean me. Um, but, uh, or maybe, you know, it's uh, $1 for the number of planets that have uh, phosphine that are a rocky planet and could potentially be a sign of life. So any amount is welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, let's get to some questions here. Do, 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 do. Okay, we have a question. Uh, it'd be great to hear, da, da, da. oh no, were the phosphines found near the surface or at a higher, cooler level in the atmosphere? Where were these phosphine particles found? So the, the phosphine was found in the clouds of Venus, uh, about 50 to 60 kilometers above the surface of the planet. And so you, you wouldn't expect to find any evidence of life on the surface of Venus. I know we, we've talked a lot about Venus being hostile and very harsh. So we're talking about a planet that is hotter than an oven. It's um, kind of over 450 degrees Celsius or over um, 850 degrees Fahrenheit. Have to do a really quick conversion there. Um, no. And, and uh, uh, so, and then you have pressures that are incredibly high on the surface of the planet as well. So kind of 90 times the pressure we have here on the earth, um, which again, that's high enough to crush the human body. So really the surface of this planet is not a nice place to be. You know, the question isn't, would a person die if they were sent to Venus, but what would get them first, I think is kind of a way to, to describe it. Um, so in the clouds themselves, uh, it's a lot milder. Um, so you have more reasonable temperatures. Um, kind of 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Why is that in Fahrenheit? <laughs> 70 to 80 degrees? Yeah, Fahrenheit? exactly. 780. Okay. Nice. It's nice. Like a summer. Yeah, exactly. So, and then um, you have much um, better pressures uh, up in the clouds as well. So more similar to what we have on the earth. Um, so, so that's kind of why the, the theory or the idea for about the past 60 years is that if there is life on Venus, it's not going to be on the surface. It's going to be up in the clouds. And that is where we find uh, the, the phosphine gas in this study. So um, we're pointing out that uh, the clouds may sound nice the way Emily is describing them. And indeed it sounds lovely, but it is still drier than the driest place on earth. And it is so acidic that it's more like you're diluting a tiny bit of water in sulf sulfuric acid rather than the other way around, which is how we handle sulfuric acid on earth. And so even extre extremophiles on earth that can tolerate acid could not tolerate the acid that is in the Venusian clouds. So yes, the temperature is lovely, the pressures are lovely, the sunlight's great, but you would melt. Okay, good to know. So <laughs> we can't be expecting to go to Venus and have a vacation and hang out with potential other life anytime soon. Okay. No. Okay, so we have a question from Sonia. Who no, no real, no real life friendship, just Zoom friendships. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's okay. Look how great this is going. No technical difficulties so far. <laughs> um, okay, so Sonia wants to know, what are the next steps now that phosphine has likely been found? Uh, and what do the what do the efforts to try and find or confirm life entail? Um, well, so there are two uncertainties in the study. Uh, one, uh, our smallest one is, is it for sure 100% phosphine? And we're working very hard on that. And so are other people to try and just confirm it's phosphine by looking at any other feature um, of it in the Venusian clouds. Mm -hmm. But if we're right and it is indeed phosphine, the other uncertainty is, is it life? And as I mentioned before, a lot of that is proving a negative and, and that's quite tough. So every day we get new messages from someone saying, have you thought about? And we try to think about it and try to figure it out. But let's say that we still collectively as a human species with all our collective expertise, we cannot come up with an explanation for phosphine on Venus. Then we need to just know more about Venus. We still don't understand the atmosphere completely. We barely understand phosphine. And we don't understand how the molecules in the atmosphere interact with one another. We don't understand how hazes form in, in, in Venus. And so the next step I think is investing much more in lab studies and theoretical studies that can help us understand atmospheres and phosphine in them better. And also, usually we would be left with nothing else to do. When most of my work, when I look for phosphine in planets far, far away, this is the best we can do. We would get to this point and I would probably just spend the rest of my career trying really hard to convince people that we do <laughs> find life because nothing else can explain it. But this time it is next door. So if we must, we could just go and check. Um, so that's already on the way to some extent. And of course people are very excited about that and I don't blame them and it is a possibility. What do you, what are your thoughts on like, what does that mean to just go check, you know, does it mean grabbing something, bringing it back to the earth? Or is that in the world of space science, like what, what does that, what does that mean taking something away from its home and bringing it back, you know? Well, it can mean many things. So you can go and, and, and look in situ. So actually check in the place that you are, uh, what are you looking at? You can also collect a sample, but I agree with you. We should be very careful. The ethics of the situation are um, definitely delicate. And if we do go and check, I hope we take it very seriously because if there is life on, on the clouds of Venus, it will be biochemically quite different from ours, or it's likely to be biochemically quite very different from ours. And so not only would they be toxic to us, but we would likely be toxic to them. And so we have a responsibility to handle any sampling very carefully. I would hate for our first interaction with alien life to be to hurt it in any way. If mm -hmm. any intelligent civilizations are watching us, they would not look kindly on that sort of behavior. Yeah, and I saw a video of you talking about what it would mean if there were other alien life watching us. And uh, just, uh, is that something that you think about a lot? And obviously you do, you had a video yeah, about I, it. Yeah, I think about an alien astronomer all the time. I always think, you know, if they were looking at us, you know, many years ago and they wouldn't see any technology, they would be like, oh, look at that rich world full of life. And then they would see us polluting for the first time. And they'd be like, oh no, this is a bad sign. They would see us releasing CFCs into the atmosphere and they'll be like, oh no, their time is gonna be over soon. And then they would see us stop using CFCs. They would see the ozone layer, you know, closing up and they would be so proud. So <laughs> yes, I often think of them. <laughs> Yes, I mean, that's what kind of hooks us into, you know, space science and sci-fi in general is just imagining what those interactions are and what we can learn from other species and what they could learn from us. It's what connects a lot of people to space science. I think it's important. That's why I'm wondering about, you know, uh, like what, how is that viewed in the world of space science? But I'm glad that we're talking about this. Um, okay, so, ba ba ba. Um, would the James Webb Telescope, this is from Alan Rafe, would the James Webb Telescope, when operational, be capable of detecting phosphine, oh, on exoplanets? We talked about that a little bit earlier, so hopefully, yes. Um, yes, some kinds around some stars, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Claire 
wants to know from you, Clara, since phosphine is not a commonly known molecule, how were you introduced to the molecule and decide to study it? So I was introduced to it in 2011 um, when my PhD supervisor, Jonathan Tennyson, who's wonderful, uh, suggested I look into it. And the reason for it was because we knew it was important on Jupiter and Saturn, as Emily explained, it's kind of a sign of violent storms dredging up from the bottom to where we see it. And he explained to me that we didn't understand its spectrum, its molecular fingerprint very well. And that just seemed outrageous to me that a molecule with just four atoms, a simple molecule that it's important to understand places like Jupiter and Saturn. It was just, it seemed unbelievable to me that we didn't know how to detect it um, all over the galaxy. And so that's what I started doing. I started figuring out exactly what its molecular fingerprint is so we can detect it anywhere. Fine. Admittedly, I wasn't thinking anywhere, including Venus, but <laughs> I was thinking of many other places. And it was during that investigation that I came across the same paper that um, Jane uh, mentioned to Emily about the penguin poop. And I found many others about, you know, badger poop and baby poop. And suddenly I was like, wait a minute, there's a link here somewhere. And it seems like the link was poop, but actually the link was all of this life was anaerobic. And once I got to that start, I started thinking maybe phosphine is a really good sign for anaerobic life elsewhere. You know, for life on earth has existed for a long time and it has been not producing oxygen uh, for longer than it has. And so if an alien astronomer, the one I was talking about earlier, was looking at us many, many years ago before oxygen reigned supreme and they didn't see oxygen, I would hope they would think, oh, but maybe there are other things like phosphine that they could have looked for. And maybe they would have known we were here. We don't actually know if early earth produced phosphine, but it could have. So cool. And it is really surprising that, you know, phosphine wasn't an, as known in, you know, in astronomy. Um, you know, it, it's something that really surprised me because, you know, when I'd worked in the past on trying to understand if certain conditions in the solar system could have life, you know, we're looking for gases that that life could potentially produce. Um, and some of the common gases that people will look for are things like um, certain complex organic molecules. So these are molecules that are made up of carbon, um, oxygen, or uh, hydrogen. And, um, you know, so you're looking for things like methane, uh, ethanol, methanol, formaldehyde, things like that. And, um, you know, when, when we do search for those things, um, there's many different ways to produce them. It's not just from life, it's also through different chemistry and various things. Um, so, you know, they're a little bit more ambiguous and it's more difficult to decipher how they're being produced. But phosphine is this unique gas that, that seems to, to fit the bill. Um, so it, it, you know, it is kind of the answer to, um, to you know, the issues that we were having um, when we were searching for life. So it, it is really surprising that more people hadn't really, you know, looked into it or tried to observe it. Um, either from exoplanets, but also, you know, just looking at the planets in our own solar system. Yeah, yeah these popular biosignatures, they're really wonderful. But as Emily mentions, you know, they're easy to make. And so life makes them, but not life makes them too. And I think, you know, in defense of the people who have been looking for those, they also tend to be more abundant. So they're easier to spot. Phosphine, although it has a beautiful spectrum, uh, it is often hard to detect because you don't expect it to be around in very large quantities because it's so hard to make. And so this idea of looking for these uh, molecules that are harder to make and produce by life, and I think it's a great idea and that's why I love phosphine, it comes with that downside that they're often hard to detect. Um, so isoprene is another one, it's a very cool molecule with no false positives for life. So, you know, if it's also really hard to make, even harder to make than phosphine. And on earth is produced in similar quantities to methane. So large quantities by trees, but it gets destroyed almost immediately. It's what makes the uh, mountains blue sometimes like the Rockies, that blue haze, that's isoprene being destroyed. And so that's another molecule my group at MIT was considering, you know, maybe if we could detect isoprene, we could detect life, but it's just hard for it to survive in an atmosphere. And so it's still really hard to detect. And that's why people rely on, you know, water and methane and molecules that yes, are more ambiguous, but at least we can spot them. Yeah. 
This is, this has been amazing. We have kind of run out of time. I have definitely lost track of time because uh, I've been so sucked in, but it's just amazing just to hear about this whole process. And, and I'm really glad that we've been able to enlighten our audience if they didn't already know about just, you know, kind of what goes into making a discovery um, that this announcement wasn't just kind of thrown out there. I don't know where there is, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, and just the amount of pressure that you've been under to prove yourselves right, you know, and like prove that you know what you're talking about is, I just, I really admire you. And I think that um, we're so lucky to have had you on our program today. Um, I guess I would close by asking, what are your hopes and dreams in the next, let's say five years for this project, I guess, or this, this discovery, like what, what, what are your hopes and dreams for what's gonna happen next? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I was going to leave you to go first. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I can go first. Um, so I think in the next five years, what I would really love to see is um, for us to, to, you know, get a better understanding of the phosphine gas that we find in Venus's atmosphere. You know, like Clara mentioned before, you can never be too sure that what you've actually detected is phosphine. So we can, you know, confirm it again with telescopes that operate in infrared wavelengths. Um, so that would be a great thing to do. And then what I really hope that we're able to do is really see if the phosphine gas actually changes over time. Um, so, you know, as Venus orbits the sun, the amount of phosphine might change and that can give us a better insight into how the phosphine is being produced in the atmosphere and if it could be life that, that's producing it in the atmosphere as well. So that's kind of in five years and in the long run, I'll just throw this in there, Mm -hmm. I would really love to see a spacecraft actually head out to Venus and start taking samples of the atmosphere and really getting into looking at how can we potentially confirm if there is life in the atmosphere. I think that would be a really amazing thing to do. Oh, yeah. What about you, Clara? I mean, all of the things that Emily said as well, um, but I, I actually am hoping Although I am very pleased about all the phosphine attention and I am very proud of my little molecule, I, I do hope that this, that people realize that phosphine is a strange molecule that we weren't considering and look how cool it turned out to be. And that might be a lesson for all other molecules that we haven't really been considering. Uh, when we were trying to make a list of all possible molecules that life could be producing, we came up with 16,367 molecules, of which phosphine is one of them. But there's so many molecules that we just don't understand and we don't have the tools to detect. And for that, we need more people, more, you know, quantum astrochemists, more molecular astrophysicists, more observers, more people who want to work on this. Um, I took, I took 10, 10 years, yeah, it took 10 years for me to understand phosphine this well. And I can't do the other 16,000 uh, <laughs> at that rate. Um, but I'm hoping lots of people are now interested in joining the field and learning about all of these weird molecules that maybe one day could also signify life elsewhere. Yes, I am hopeful for all of these things as well. I'm hopeful that one day I'll get a glimpse of some life form living in the clouds around Venus and that it's really cute with a smiley face. Uh, <laughs> those are my dreams. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thanks to our YouTube audience too, for asking all your amazing questions. If we didn't get to all of your questions, which we may as we might not have, um, please feel free to reach out to askadler at adlerplanetarium.org. Email us and one of our experts will get back to you as soon as they can. Um, also, would you mind sharing your Twitter handles or ways to contact you as well, Emily and Clara? Yes, absolutely. If you absolutely. have any questions, ask Dr. Phosphine. Yes. Yeah, and similarly, send questions my way. I love answering questions, particularly about life in the universe and the possibilities. So, yeah. Yay, awesome. And, and, and the Adler uh, has tweeted their handles as well, so you can go check them out there. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you all. Uh, Laura is going to be sharing some more links for uh, donating to the Adler, um, a, a new uh, program that we have coming out. Well, it's, it's been going on for a little bit, but uh, we have our Adler scope blog that you can check out that Laura is also going to be sharing. Um, and also a survey, a link to a survey to let us know how we're doing, what you would like to see more of on Adler Astronomy Live. And yeah, thank you all so much. Emily, Clara, it was such an honor to talk to you and meet you today. 
Thank you. It was a pleasure. And donate to Adler Planetarium. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. And thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Yay. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. And bye, Emily. Bye, Meredith. Bye. bye. <laughs> and thanks, Mark, for all your visuals, as always.